convene this October 20th, 2022 meeting of the Centerville Town Council. If everyone could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silence. Pledge of Allegiance. We are going to start as we normally do with a review of minutes from past meetings. Uh, is there a motion to accept or uh, any changes that need to be made? Motion to approve as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have a closed session statement. Uh, the Town Council met in closed session on Thursday, October 20th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. at the Liberty Building, 107 North Liberty Street, second floor meeting room to discuss personnel in accordance with the Maryland Open Meetings Act. Five members of the town council voted to close the session. The authority to close the session is found in section 3-305 of the general provisions article. The town council discussed the following topics. Personnel. We discussed the performance of an employee. No actions were taken. The following members and staff were present. Stephen K. Klein, president. Ashley H. Kaiser, vice president. Eric Johnson, Jr., Daniel B. Worth, and Jim A. Beecham, members. Charles Kugel, town manager, Sharon Van Emberg, town attorney, and Carolyn Brinkley, town clerk. The meeting adjourned at 6.39 p.m. We'll now move into a citizens forum. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to read the public forum statement? Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting and we welcome your participation. By attending, you acknowledge that this session is recorded and aired live on QAC TV 7. During the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. The scheduled agenda is available on the information table just outside. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The Town Council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely. And in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we'll refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. Any member of the public wishing to come up and share their thoughts, welcome to at this point. There'll be another one at the end of the meeting as well. And during And also a public hearing on the growth ordinance. All right, there are no, no, no one here to provide comment. Uh, we might switch around the uh, order here a little bit and go with uh, uh, move into appearances and then just hold off because we've got a few minutes before the public hearing was supposed to begin. So uh, we'll move into appearances. Uh, I would like to make a motion to appoint Robert Hobbs, the chief of the Centerville Police Department. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Wonderful. Mr. Hobbs, we'll meet you in front and swear you in. your name in full and repeat after me. I, Robert Hobbs, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and that I will be faithful, I will be faithful, and bear true allegiance, and bear true allegiance, to the state of Maryland, to the state of Maryland, and support the Constitution and laws thereof, and support the Constitution and the laws thereof, and that I will, and I will, to the best of my skill and judgment, to the best of my skill and judgment, diligently and faithfully, diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, without partiality or prejudice, execute the office of, execute the office of, Chief of Police for the Centerville Police Department, Chief of Police for the Centerville Police Department, according to the Constitution and laws of this state, according to the Constitution and the laws of this state, the Town Charter, the Town Charter, and laws and ordinances of the Town of Centerville, and the laws and ordinances of the Town of Centerville. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. We have a few, that's not your name. <laughs> Certificate of promotion to Robert Hobbs. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna have a whole 
counsel come down? I know your father wanted to pin you. We'll have the whole council come down and get your photo. And the spirit of promoting uh, one this evening as well as long as the council has a few minutes. Um, Sergeant Charles Amy Larimore, front and center. Charles Andy Larimore of the Centerville Police Department, I Chief Robert Hobbs will commit myself to empowering you and developing your potential as a leader. I believe responsibility must be accompanied by sufficient authority to accomplish the mission. I believe in the principles of the delegation and accountability. I believe firmly that the police department does not solely exist to avoid mistakes, but it exists to accomplish something greater. What I expect in return is your focus on the mission and on the needs of those whom you are responsible. You are responsible for the safety of this community. You are also responsible for the performance of the people and for meeting their legitimate needs. Your officers need to know how they are doing. They need to know willful incompetence will not be ignored. Good work will be recognized and honest mistakes will be dealt with differently than misconduct. They need to know that you care for them and you will do everything you can to help them succeed in their mission. Your first and only loyalty must be to this town and its police department. With this being said, I believe you have proven to support our mission and will provide a leadership to its highest degree. It is with great pleasure I present to you a certificate of promotion that certifies that you, Charles Andy Larimore, are hereby promoted from the rank of sergeant to the rank of lieutenant, effective this 20th day of October 2022 in the town of Centerville, Queen Anne County, Maryland. Congratulations. Carol, why don't Carol, why don't we Carol, thanks to why don't we go ahead and, and do the Centerville Day update and then we'll do the hearing and then we'll go right into old business, which is the grunt out. Okay. Good afternoon. How are you? Evening, I'm sorry. Good. How's everyone this evening? Good, how are you? Um, I know in your packet you had uh, a few materials on Centerville Day, and I just wanted to give you some quick highlights. So Centerville Day will be this Saturday. This is our 11th Centerville Day. Uh, we will have 45 vendor tables. That includes our corporate sponsors who requested space as well as businesses and nonprofits. Four food vendors. We're debuting uh, the mobile library for the Queen Anne's County Library. You might recall that was supposed to be debuted at the county fair, but it didn't work out. So they decided they wanted to debut it here at uh, Centerville Day, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we uh, added in some uh, new and interesting features, including uh, our 2019 Teacher of the Year, Heather Eflin, is doing a, um, two sessions, interactive sessions with the kids, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, we added three new volunteers to our group, including a mother-daughter team, the daughter is seven years old, and we are having a hard time keeping up with her. She's a uh, she's pretty uh, interesting kid, and the family just moved here uh, two months ago from Nashville, Tennessee, jumped right in to volunteer, so we're, we're really pleased about that. Um, we 
are up to $4,550 in corporate sponsorships, which we're really happy about. I wasn't quite sure how long it would take us to get back to pre-pandemic uh, numbers, but we're there already. So uh, we're really um, enthusiastic about our sponsors. You have uh, the poster in your packet. Uh, we had two new sponsors. The Y is back. Uh, they haven't been in involved with Center to Fill Day for about four years. They've come back not only as a corporate sponsor, but they're gonna be helping to manage the kids zone this year. So we're really thrilled about that. Um, sure Update has come on as a media sponsor. Uh, they are providing $1,000 worth of both digital and print ads, uh, which is awesome. And um, I would be remiss if not to mention that we could not do this without our public works department as well as our police department and a lot of behind the scenes folks like Sure Lumber, who is storing our 350 pumpkins. Um, <laughs> so we deliver pumpkins to them, they store them for us, and then uh, on the day of the event, guy comes with a forklift and delivers them. So we can't do uh, much more than that. So uh, we are really lucky uh, to have the kind of generosity, uh, time as well as uh, resources that we get for this event. So it, you don't have it on your calendar. We hope that you make it out and thanks. We thank a lot of people. Let me thank you on behalf of the council here. here. I'm not sure this would be as effective and as great an event without you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? All right. Thank you for bearing with us. We'll move into uh, the public hearing for ordinance 9-2022. The subject of this hearing is Ordinance 9-2022, an ordinance of the Town Council of Centerville granting the application of Green Development Incorporated for growth allocation under the provisions of the Centerville Town Code. I will now ask Ms. Van Emberg to provide background on Ordinance 9-2022. Good evening. Good evening. As you mentioned, um, Ordinance 9-2022 is an ordinance for growth allocation. It's to convert 40.372 acres of land on the Carter Farm from a limited development area to a intensely developed area. And that would allow the development of the proposed 126 dwelling units that the Carter Farm is proposing. This is the next step in that growth allocation process. Um, this has been through the Planning Commission. They recommended approval. It came to you all. You all had a public hearing. As a result of that hearing, the ordinance and findings of fact that are attached to it were introduced and at your last meeting I think you asked me to or the last time this came up anyway you asked me to amend the ordinance to change one of the requirements related to the archaeological assessment so that is the only change from what you saw when it was introduced and so tonight is a public hearing on the ordinance itself happy to answer any questions any questions for the town attorney Thank you. I will now call upon Carolyn Brinkley, town clerk, to present evidence of the published notice of this hearing. Certificate of publication in the state of Maryland County of Queen Anne's this is to certify that the, <clears throat> excuse me, le annex legal advertisement has been published in the 10-7-22 Record Observer and the 10-5-22 Star Democrat for Ordinance 09 We will first hear from all those in favor of proposed ordinance 9-2022, and then we will hear from those opposed. Please keep all comments to three minutes. You are welcome to provide written testimony to the town council as well. Clerk would like to read the public comment guidelines. Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting and we welcome your participation. By attending, you acknowledge that this session is recorded and aired live on QAC TV 7. During the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The town council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely. And in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we'll refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from all those in favor 
of proposed ordinance 9-2022. We will now hear from all those opposing proposed ordinance 9-2022. Step up to the mic. Thank you, Council. I'm Tim McCluskey. I live here in Centerville. Uh, thank you for the time this evening. I'm here in opposition to the approval of this growth allocation ordinance for the Carter Farm. There are many ambitions in the findings of fact that I believe that you should, that should preclude you from approving this ordinance. But the main reason this evening that I believe you should reject this ordinance is because of the capacity issues related to the wastewater treatment plant. You currently have total discretion over this project. However, it is quickly on its way to becoming a buy right development and the developer wants 100% of the remaining, water, uh, remaining sewer allocations. At the September 15th council meeting, the town attorney was asked, at what point do allocations become by right? She stated that when both the growth allocation and the PUD ordinances are approved, the developer would have an entitlement to uh, allocations. The town runs the risk of litigation by the developer if we continue to provide approvals uh, and, it, and, and ask that they continue to spend money and then tell them that they can't have the allocations. Um, I urge you to reject this ordinance at least until a path forward for building and financing a new treatment plant is found. Current daily flow is at 93% of the permitted capacity, 93%. That is scary close uh, to our permitted limit. Um, you should not approve the growth allocation that would get you one step away from committing to using up 100% of the remaining sewer allocations. I cannot believe that we're even considering a development of this size at this time with the capacity issues that we're having. Public Works Director at the September 15th Council meeting stated, you have enough allocations for this project, but that's the end of it nothing else. In a recent council meeting, it was stated that we are dangerously close, if not past a point where it could fail. Why would you continue to move a development further if you were at a point of failure? Mr. Worth, con congratulations on your victory. Uh, in the recent League of Women Voters Forum, when asked about approving the growth allocation ordinance, you said, and I quote, I don't see how we can approve a growth allocation for a project, no matter what the conditions are, when we don't have the wastewater capacity to service that area. If we really are that close to capacity, we need to reserve it for commercial growth rather than using it up on one project and it will be years and years before we can do anything else." End quote. Mr. Beecham, congratulations on your victory. In the same forum, you stated, and I quote, that it is a personal mission of yours to get an assisted living facility at the business park. Um, end quote. If this growth allocation is approved and allocations are granted, you can forget an assisted living program or any of the related businesses that would, uh, that would be attracted um, in this term or any subsequent council terms. Both Mr. Beecham and Mr. Worth stated in the forum that they favored rewriting the allocation policy away from a first come first serve policy to one that provided a blend of commercial and residential development. If this ordinance is passed and the development moves forward, you don't get that chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else opposing the growth allocation ordinance? evening. <laughs> um, I kind of just have a bunch of dumb questions that I'm going to put out there. Um, well, first of all, so we moved here last year. We live kind of <clears throat> 306 Beach Chesterfield, so we're sort of right behind where the Carter Farm development would be. I don't know that we would have moved here had we known that that was going to happen, first of all. But we are here and we love it here. Um, but there are things that I don't understand, like how if we don't have the results of the archaeological survey, how are we? How is it just going to get passed from being an LDA to an IDA? Um, the the traffic survey, I don't think that's publicly available. I would like to see it. I mean, I don't know how this is going to affect traffic. I know it studied traffic on Chesterfield Avenue, but there's only Liberty Street that goes out. So, does this traffic study take it that into account? Um, I know that the wastewater runoff right now, it's not. It's the best possible of drainage into the creek because there's nothing on it, it's not being farmed, so I know it's supposed to improve that drainage, but how? So I guess I just worry that it's going to get passed to being an IDA without the answers to these questions being answered or presented to the public in a way that kind of a novice like me can know about. I just want to know that these questions are being answered before it's like little by little, like okay now we pass it through to an IDA and then we approve this and drip by drip till it's like suddenly there. So I just want to know that we're slowing down enough to get these questions answered before it gets blanket approval. So, thanks. The, um, the, we can get the traffic study up on the website. 
they, they did review 11 or 12 different intersections. But we'll, we'll get the traffic study on those. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Cal Gray. Uh, don't live in town, but have an office in town and do business in town. Um, I just know you have hopes on a strategy, and I know this sewer treatment plant fix up, redo is extremely expensive, like $27 million. So we hope the town gets the money from the state, but you don't know. And a lot of things can happen. If you don't get it and you've done this, I mean, you're stuck. So keep your options uh, open. And uh, I just kind of oppose it because it's just not fair to give one and a everything that's that's left. Um, you know, if you got some guy out uh, off Little Kidwell that has an empty lot next to him, wants to build a house for his mom to retire there next to him, and their allocations are gone, can't do it. <coughs> so there's there's that need for infill in the future. Um, and the other thing I'll say is, are they still calling this an agri hood? They are. Okay, because the, from everything I've seen is it's it's not that and can't be called that. I think they had seven acres. And I asked, like, are you going to grow vegetables for this whole neighborhood on seven acres? He said, no, nah, we'll probably rent it to a farmer. I said, well, we're farmers, and I guarantee you no farmer is renting seven acres in the middle of this neighborhood. <laughs> You're just not moving the equipment in and out of there. It's just not going to happen. So I, I just have a, a problem with it being called an agri-hood because it's just, it's just not. And uh, I think with that agri-hood, you get the right to this commercial property up front, which to me isn't legit if you're not an agri-hood, and that's just supposed to be in the neighborhood. For the, for the neighbors, it's just sort of a freebie commercial property right up on a road that really shouldn't, shouldn't have it. Especially over all the years and the effort that Centerville as a town has put in trying to get uh, people to come downtown and get downtown centered and, and get a focus of business there. So that's it. Thank you for hearing me. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, please forgive me for some disorganized comments here. I just learned about this meeting uh, a few hours ago uh, from some concerned neighbors. And unfortunately, a lot of my neighbors, I live on Chesterfield Avenue. And for the record, I'm Andrea Gerard. I live at 308 Chesterfield. And um, many of my neighbors are very concerned about this. And um, I, I, my, my job is I am a special education teacher specialist. And as a special education teacher specialist, I spend a lot of time as a special education teacher. I have taught many, 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 many subjects. And one of the subjects I have taught is environmental science. And a very basic high school education on environmental science will tell you that whenever you have water that is near, that, that whenever you have land that is near water, that land is really critical because that land acts as a sponge. And when we have heavy rains, like, oh, from hurricanes, which do happen around here, <laughs> um, that the, the water really needs that land as a sponge to soak it up when the rain comes down super fast. And I know people will say, well, we're so high up, we don't have to worry about flooding. Trust me, we do have to worry about flooding because when that sponge is gone, that water doesn't have a place to go to. And so that's one of my main concerns, is for flooding. Um, I, I am supportive of development, but I am supportive of, of moderate development, of conservative development, being smart, being financially responsible, being very fiscally responsible with, with what we do and with those allocations. Um, another subject that I taught was math. <laughs> and I, I have to say that I'm a little bit concerned about these numbers as far as our sewer allocations. I did happen to move to Centerville after the Northbrook debacle, but um, I've heard enough about what happened with Northbrook and not having sufficient water and sewage for Northbrook, which I, my, my child has had a daycare in Northbrook and their yard would sometimes, their, their, um, what, their grinder would fail and they'd have sewage pop up and things like that. I just want to make sure that we are not creating a lot of problems for our area and that we are doing appropriate development. Also, as a special education teacher specialist, I am in the schools a lot. <laughs> and um, Centerville Elementary is at capacity. The, like, there's really no, like, I don't know what they would do with, with more kids there. Um, 
I think what they would have to do, quite honestly, is they would have to have the students from Northbrook go to Churchill Elementary. And so that's realistically what we would be looking at because there's not enough room at Centerville and there's no place to put portables at Centerville Elementary. It's just impossible. Um, and also, at the state is requiring us to expand our three-year-old education. So Centerville's only gonna be growing because we're gonna be addressing the needs of a greater population as we include those three-year-olds at Centerville Elementary. So um, those are my concerns. So, thank, thank you. you. Just right on time. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Joe Brown. I live in um, Concerto Avenue in Centerville. Uh, I'm speaking in opposition to this uh, development for several reasons. First of all is that the town of Centerville has a great imbalance in our assessments. We're 83% relying on residential property for our tax revenue. That's the only 17% or commercial. We recently turned down a commercial opportunity to come here based on citizen complaints. I mean, we hear a lot of complaints about this development from the people who live down there. Um, so that's certainly a reason to take a good look at it. But I have um, I have attended most of the hearings that the developer had at the library and different places here at the meeting, several meetings. I really don't have a lot of confidence in this developer that they could pull this thing off. Um, th as they've appeared before the council, they've had many, you guys have had many questions and the various people that have sat there and over the last two administrations um, and, and had difficulty getting answers. So I'd hate to see the last bit of our um, capacity, water and sewer capacity go into a development like this that might end up going bust and then lose the opportunity to bring in a business that might decide to come to town until we get a new wastewater plant. So I don't think it makes good sense to continue to uh, put residential property on on uh, the water and sewer until we have more capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Anybody else? Centerville Town Council will consider all comments presented this evening before making a final decision regarding proposed ordinance 9-2022. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn this hearing? Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion that we allow the... Um, we have to... Adjourn the public hearing. We have to adjourn first. the public hearing. Uh, okay. We have to adjourn before I can... Can I make this motion and then you can decide if it's appropriate or not? Sure. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm not following the script, I know. I would like to leave the... Uh, record open for written comment for another two weeks. Sure. I'll second that motion. Okay. All those in favor of leaving the record open for two weeks, say aye. 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 Opposed? I make a motion that this uh, hearing be adjourned. Second? Second. All those in favor of adjourning this hearing, say aye. 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 All right, thank you. <laughs> Do you mind if I just make a comment or two? Sure, I now declare this hearing adjourned. We will perhaps move into, we're moving into old business anyway, so we'll reflect that on the agenda. Old business is ordinance 9-2022. This is a <coughs> second reading, and it is sponsored by Council Member Johnson. I'll turn it over to you for your comments. Yes, so this is of course, once again, an ordinance of the Council of Centerville granting the application of Green Development Incorporated for growth allocation under the provision of the Centerville Town Code. Um, Having received a lot of arrows, if you will, um, as one of the proponents of this project, I first just want to say that um, we need to validate all the concerns that have been raised. Um, I don't know that I have been privy to any feedback that hasn't raised concerns that I feel are legitimate and that need to be addressed. Um, through this journey, I think, at least from my perspective, and I'm, I'm tracking on all the documents that have flowed in and out, uh, the answers that have been provided by the developer have been sound. I think that's what in part led to a favorable recommendation from our planning commission. Um, that being said, I have been taking a lot of the concerns and those that have been raised tonight um, in particular. Uh, the letters that we continue to get from folks and emails to produce a punch list of questions that folks still feel have not been answered. And then working with the developer, uh, Rob Etkin, as I shared with my fellow council members, 
a representative of the development team for this project um, has been given an additional role moving forward to really deal with community engagement. And so I have agreed to go to folks' homes uh, in the area on Chesterfield Avenue with Rob to meet in the evening whenever folks would like that. So please feel free to, to take us up on that. Um, I don't have to come if you want to just meet with the developer, but I'm happy to do that too. Um, that being said, uh, one of the things that I just think is worth highlighting is that this council, uh, minus the two folks that, that have just joined us, uh, has consistently up to this point with the developer present mentioned the most critical of the concerns that have been raised, which really is that wastewater treatment facility capacity. And it has been uh, made very clear that there are folks sitting up here and may be in the two that have just joined us that are absolutely gonna vote against any sort of allocation knowing that we don't have that uh, capacity and, and that the developer needs to know that. And so for better or for worse, I think it does speak uh, highly of our developer that they have a level of confidence that the risk that they have taken up to this point and continue to take um, assumes that we are gonna get funding for not only a replacement wastewater treatment facility, but expansion. Um, they're taking a big risk, and I think we've spent some time with our uh, town attorney asking at what point do we truly achieve uh, a buy right project. Our, our formal uh, councilman, uh, Tim McCluskey, raised that point, and I think that's an excellent point. And you know, are we there, or are we still shy of that? Um, and last, I would just say, um, I like the idea that we're gonna allow additional feedback, so Dan, thank you for that. And uh, again, for folks out there that would like to take up the uh, opportunity to meet directly with the developer, we'll come out to the home and, and answer those questions. So I grew up on Chesterfield Avenue, grew up knowing Judge Carter and his family, and I, I can appreciate on a very, very personal level the concerns that folks have that live there as I was a fellow resident at one point. Thank you. Thank you. If we, vote no on this, uh, the town attorney I'm asking, uh, it goes away for a year, right? And we cannot revisit it principally in its same form for a year. If we table the allocation, we can revisit it. Is that a correct assumption? Okay. Do we want to vote on this tonight, given the fact that we're keeping the record open for two more weeks? I would move to table ordinance 09 2022. Second. Second. <laughs> uh, motion's been made and seconded to table ordinance 9 2022. Uh, is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right. Ordinance 10 2022, the code reference corrections, second reading. Sponsored by me. <laughs> uh, this has come back to us from the Planning Commission with a uh, recommendation for adoption. Uh, and folks may remember this is uh, an ordinance of the Town Council of Centerville to amend the town's zoning ordinance codified as Chapter 170 of the Town Code to correct various references throughout the charter, excuse me, throughout Chapter 170. So uh, as you scroll through this, it's just a, a series of Comar adjustments or places where we've uh, changed other things and now things need to be renumbered. There are not a ton of uh, substantive changes in this document other than those numbers. Uh, I will call attention to uh, page five of five, uh, amendment 170-64D. Uh, we have, uh, because of the old three-person council, uh, there was this uh, expectation or, or rule here that uh, two-thirds vote of the town council was required uh, if we were going to vote in contrary to the planning commission. Uh, so that's been struck now. That two-thirds requirement of a five-person council would be essentially uh, you know, a supermajority of a five-person council. So we've amended that as well. So uh, this is a second reading, and we can adopt this tonight, and indeed I would encourage us to do that. We have to have a, a um, public hearing. Oh, wow, okay. I'm and just sorry. to confirm with Sharon, on the that last change from the two-thirds, this is consistent now with state law, right? We, we, yes. Couldn't really have that in there? Yes. Okay. We'll have a public hearing before we vote on this. Well, in good time. 
All right, we are going to turn this over to Councilmember Beecham for Antenna Installation at Symphony Village. Thank you. Um, I understand the town had proceeded with the concept of an 80 foot spire uh, in this traffic circle at Symphony Village for the purposes of a antenna installation for the um, radio read water meters. Um, I think Kip can easily testify that I've been a hardcore fan of radio read meters. <coughs> um, he probably remembers me pushing him a little too hard sometimes to get the meters changed out as quickly as we could uh, because I did see efficiencies and value in having radio read meters for this community. But an 80 foot spire um, is not a flagpole in my personal perspective and I have to believe there are alternatives out there um, to look at. I'm asking council to um, stop action on the installation of that uh, antenna until we can thoroughly vet other other opportunities. I know that uh, Mr. McCluskey had mentioned a specific technology. I don't know if it applies here, but it's a, a hint that there might be another solution out there. So I'm, I'm not killing the antenna. I'm just asking for a delay to do some research on and make sure we have the best solution that is not divisive in one of our communities. So I guess I would make a motion. I'm not sure exactly how to word it, so I'll ask Sharon to correct me if I say something silly. But I'd like to, to make a motion that um, town council support the, um, the halt of progress by the staff and uh, public works in implementing the antenna installation at Symphony Village to allow for further investigation. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any conversation? Yeah, I, while well, I appreciate the, the want to pause, I, th I feel pretty strongly that we ask a lot of our town staff and we've asked a lot lately of our public works department and especially our public works director and I trust our staff. I trust that our staff has done the research to come up with the best solution for the town overall. I understand that there are folks in Symphony Village that don't want the flagpole. It's gonna have a flag on it, it is a flagpole. Um, I just think sometimes we have to look at the greater good of the community and getting the rest of the radio read meter system online to me is bigger than any one community, is bigger than the concerns that folks might have. I shared at the last meeting where we discussed this that I have a lot of concerns related to the why. You know, it's right behind where we live. I, stuff has fallen off my walls because of it, but I want a YMCA because it's good for the community. And so we deal with impacts that we might not like when it's better for the greater good. And so I wish that folks in Symphony Village could embrace the flagpole. You know, there's like research that shows that in 28 days you stop seeing things. Like if you hang a piece of art on your wall, you don't really notice it anymore in less than a month. I think that's probably gonna become very true of this flagpole for a lot of people. And I just, I, like I said, I trust our staff. And so to me, a vote to pause is a vote of no confidence for our staff. And that's not a vote I'm willing to make. And so I'm a hard no on pausing because I'm a very, very significant yes on trusting our public works director. And, and that I feel is what this question boils down to. I appreciate your comments, but um, the suggestion that I don't trust our staff, I'd, I'd like to to say that's really not the point here. Well, I'll associate myself with uh, Vice President Kaiser's comments. I think we, you know, the staff has done due diligent work here. Um, you know, I think this sort of opens Pandora's box, right, to revisiting every decision the staff makes. Uh, no one up here is a full-time employee of the town. I don't have the expertise to make these types of decisions. I expect none of us do, and, and I think, you know, we, uh, whether or not we intend it to be a uh, sort of a forum on our staff, I think it does turn out to be that way. Uh, and so I am uh, very much in favor of, of not delaying, letting the staff move forward uh, with their recommendation here. Any other discussion? Um, I would just add that this, this has been a tough one for me. I, I share the sentiments that have been raised by pretty much everybody up here. Um, and, and I think what's tough for me is the issues on which we get a mass attendance by our community, we obviously should pause and listen. And I really think that we have tried to do that. Um, interestingly enough on this issue, 
I think all of us up here, including previous generations of councils, we all run on the intent of better communication. And for this particular project, I for one have been so damn impressed by our public work staff helping to put together a document of questions and answers, going into the community and, and hearing directly those concerns, sharing that packet. I took the opportunity, um, as we do not have an official town social media page, to post that on Facebook, post it on Nextdoor, take a look at those comments, and I believe the packet was even updated after that based on additional questions that came in. So here we have a, a ton of folks in Symphony Village absolutely against that. We, therefore, yeah, there, there, there's a reason to pause, but on this particular issue where I am right now, I would like us to, to not pause and to move forward. Any further discussion? Um, yes, I, 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 I think we should spend some time reviewing um, the due diligence that was performed. I mean, I understand some of the documentation would be proprietary and that would kind of limit what we, you know, what we were able to share with the public. Um, I think that, you know, um, Jim and I could review that material with, with Kip and perhaps understand the issue better um, to see if that this solution really was the, the best one. Can, can I ask a practical, I hear what you're saying, a practical question, and maybe Kip, if it would help if you came up for this. To the extent that we did not vote to pause it this evening, and there is that opportunity for the two of you to get that information, and then if there is a specific option that um, Councilman McCluskey is aware of, to the extent that, say, two weeks from now, there's an opportunity to, to get smart on that, those documents, as you indicated, Councilman Worth, um, and, and potential other models, is there anything happening in the next two weeks, three weeks on this project to where we really do need to vote on it right now? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, to get to some of the points that were brought up, yes, it's going to be detrimental. If okay. you stop it right now, it's not going to be for a few weeks. I can tell you that me and my staff have beat ourselves in the ground on this issue. Count the three councils sitting here you've heard all the, the stuff we've done our due diligence one thing that I can tell you you're talking about different technologies and stuff yes there's loads of technology out there to do everything differently but doing it differently means using a different meter vendor which we're not mixing meters that makes no <laughs> sense whatsoever <laughs> Agree to replace 2,000 meters in town just because somebody doesn't want this antenna that's a major major expense and time okay there are other meters out there that do things differently that doesn't make them better than the meters that we're using some of those are downfalls to those meter companies. There's some of those meters that communicate like a daisy chain. If one of those meters in that daisy chain goes out, you've lost everything behind it. And that is everything we've looked into. We're using this type of meter. We have been for years, long before I came here, because we feel, and my predecessors, people before me, all felt this was the best meter company for our situation. And I still feel that way. Um, you know, we can sit here and argue this until we're all blue in the face. I have came forth and I have given you my best to explain why that tower is needed flagpole was a way to appease it and make it look you know more appealing to the public rather than sticking an 80 foot three legged regular antenna up there the engineers with the the company are kind of going over and beyond to try and make this work and conceal the antenna they're working currently right now to put the antenna inside the flagpole so all you see is a flagpole. No antenna on the top. There's no guarantees 
on that until they finish their work on it. So, like I say, yes, I can tell you there's technology out there, but it doesn't fit our meters. It doesn't fit the uh, program that we use for reading the meters. So it's more than just the meters. It's far, far reaching. So it's, it, there's a lot more to it. Um, we have a motion and a second, Kip, so I'm going to call the question unless anybody has. Yeah, I just want to add one thing, if you don't mind. I, you know, not that we're going to turn this into a forum on my feelings about elections in Centerville, but as long as we're going to have an election every year, we cannot spend the last two months of every year rehashing things that the council has already addressed. And so I'm thrilled to have you both up here with us. I think you know, we're going to have a really strong town council for the next at least a year that all of us are here. I just, we can't spend two months or whatever every year pausing everything that councils past have already looked at. We, we looked at this, the five of us that were here just a couple of months ago. And so it would be detrimental to the town and the residents of the town if every single year when we have an election, we're just gonna have the same conversation again. And for staff not to be able to just trust what's told to them. So if, if I was town staff or the department head and I'm told something in August, I'm gonna think, well, let me just wait because going to have new leadership in just a couple months and maybe they're going to change their minds and so I just I really can't express strongly enough how against the pause I am can I appeal to the, the president here I know you called the question but just one additional comment before we vote that I think is critical sure. yeah. just I think it is worth validating I can't speak for our two new councilmen but my sneaky suspicion is that as they campaigned they had a lot of folks from Symphony Village say, if you get elected, will you? And I think it's worth validating that and at least saying, hey, there's a ton of folks that aren't happy with where we are in this. But I want to look anybody from Symphony Village in the eye and say, I have read at least 100 pages of people against, for, questions, and our job, of course, is to integrate all of that. So it does not go unnoticed taking phone calls, I get chased down in food line, and I promise I, for a, and I think most of us up here, if not all of us, have that same posture. I wasn't chasing you. <laughs> <laughs> I will just uh, editorialize that staff is available to town council <coughs> members to talk about these things before these meetings, before it comes to this point. Please avail yourself of our town staff to have these conversations uh, so we don't have to get to this type of situation. Uh, all those in favor of the pause say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Nay. Nay. Uh, the motion does not carry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. We will move into an update on the YMCA led by Councilmember Johnson. So I would like to invite our YMCA leadership to come forward this evening. We have with us um, Robbie Gill, the CEO, Tony Sigman, Vice President of Development. And so, um, sorry, I had to use the Y as my example. It's <laughs> no, all good. What came to mind? <laughs> if, if you live in Centerville, and especially if you shop um, at that end of town, uh, the Acme Shopping Center, then you have seen what has been an incredible amount of progress. So we thought it would be appropriate, and the council agreed to just have you guys come in and give us an update. And I know you have some visuals, so if you tell me when to advance the slides, sure. we'll do that. Well, thank you for the opportunity. We appreciate it. Um, uh, just quickly about the YMCA, we're a not-for-profit 501c3. This is our 165th year on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, um, providing services. So we've been around before Lincoln even thought about running for president. So um, the Y serves about 45,000 people across the Eastern Shore of Maryland, as far north as Elkton and as far south as Chincoteague. This project in Centerville is something we've been working on a long time. As a matter of fact, uh, Jim was part of those meetings way back when. Uh, the council was only three people back then. Jim left, moved, came back, ran again. Like, it's been a while. We've been plugging away at it. Uh, what I would say is anytime you're trying to do something as transformational as this project is, it just takes a lot of work and divine intervention. And so we're excited to be in the place we were. We broke ground officially um, back in uh, 2021. Uh, pricing was starting to get a little squirrely, and so we did all the site work at that time and thought, well, maybe we'll just hold tight and pricing would settle down and get a little cheaper. That did not happen. It only got more expensive. Uh, so we um, decided uh, to move forward. We've been very blessed to date. Um, uh, the project uh, for the facility is going to cost about 
22 million, we've raised 19.2 million uh, to date towards that. As a not-for-profit, we provide financial assistance. So anyone that wants to participate in YMCA programs and services as a member uh, can do that uh, with no financial barrier and to making sure we have a facility that's debt-free is essential. Um, so if you drive by there now, you'll see the facility under construction. It's a 70,000 square foot facility. It is the largest YMCA that we'll have on the Eastern Shore uh, designed to serve about 10,000 folks. It's also unique in that it has a senior center in it as well. So senior center programming somewhat went away in Centerville back in 2012. Uh, we're excited to partner with the county. Uh, the senior center is, there isn't a separate door for the senior center. It's all one and the same, similar to our model in St. Michael's, where it's shared space and connecting uh, older adults to a variety of uh, senior center programming and YMCA programming. That senior center, which we'll probably name it something other than senior center, but that uh, program will run five days a week. They'll provide uh, meals uh, as well and will be a comprehensive program as well as all the programs and services you would normally see with a YMCA. Um, so we've got a few photos that we'll show there. Couldn't get it to stop before I know. There you go. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's, the, um, yeah, that's the front elevation will look like. Uh, on the far left, you can see the slanted roof. That's the aquatic center. So it's uh, a six lane, uh, I would call it mild water pool. So it's a little bit uh, in the middle. So we can, uh, one of the challenges with the cold water pool is it's hard uh, for older adults and um, special needs populations for water classes and then all the little kids get blue lips when you want to teach them how to swim. So it's a little bit warm enough to be able to do that, but you can still swim in it. There's all glass on the bottom and then cow wall on the top, so it'll be beautiful. There's glue lamb um, beams within that particular facility uh, that will help with sound quality. If you've been in some pools, they can echo and be kind of noisy. You won't find that will be the case here. Uh, with the entrance to the front um, and going back, let's see what other pictures we've got. It's over the top, yep. So um, as you go uh, on the right there, can I stand up and point a little bit? You can do whatever cool? you like. Sure. Make sure you're talking into a microphone. Yeah, here, I'll <laughs> give you. Is that a, well, you can let me. No, you can, that, the comment, the public comment here. microphone. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. And when you're done, drop it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So as you come into the facility, there's actually a door right here. So for hosting a swim meet, you can just go straight in for, to participate without having to go through the Y, which would be nice. This is, uh, there's another uh, partnership model in partnership with the Radcliffe Foundation where we have a career development resource center, which is an opportunity to connect uh, folks that are looking for employment opportunity and training and development, uh, as well as mentoring there. And we'll be providing a fiscal literacy program free of charge for middle and high school kids. So there's... Uh, conference rooms and meeting spaces, a stay and play area for parents who have younger kids and they, they've got kids that are themselves participating in the program and took their kids here. This huge space back here is the wellness center. You've got a commercial kitchen that will be used for um, the senior center, conference rooms and multiple purpose spaces for everything from uh, group exercise classes to pottery classes and art based classes. So uh, you got a ton of multi-purpose space to, uh, for programming. And then this is a, a double gymnasium. So we initially were going to build a, a, a single gym. And then when we built our Y in Chestertown, it has a double gym with a walking track. Uh, I think there's a, a picture of that maybe. Yep. Uh, so that's, yep, so this is it here. Um, it it's, was so popular uh, and heavy use, especially in the winter. So many people love to walk. Um, and be able to stay active in the winter that we decided to expand that. So this will give us a huge uh, indoor space year round. It'll have six indoor pickleball courts. So for all those pickleball folks in the county, it gives them a space to do that as well. And as we found in uh, Chestertown, um, the Y really becomes the front porch of the community. That Y opened in J uh, January. There's 19,000 people that live in Kent County and the Y is serving one in three people uh, right now and so and a quarter of those are on financial assistance so while the gym was super expensive to add the uh, um, double the size you know this is a once in a uh, kind of generation um, opportunity and so um, it's going to be a really great resource what's the next picture we got there now this is the pool at the Chestertown Y so the physical 
pool itself um, will look just like that. Uh, the biggest difference is, um, as I mentioned, the glue lamp ceiling and windows along the side. Um, you know, we'll host the high school teams uh, within this facility, which will be a great resource for the school system. In many of our counties, we're doing water safety programming, and the best model we have is in Wacomico County. We have a model there that's been in place for nearly 30 years, and I would love to see that happen here, where we teach every fifth grader swim lessons as a part of the PE curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, so there isn't a kid that doesn't come out of Wacomico County that doesn't learn to swim as a part of that. It takes a lot of work because you've got to build it into a schedule and transportation, but having the resource here uh, within Centerville will make a big difference in being able to do that and being located in proximity to the high school and the school down the street will be a, will be a huge help. What's the, yep, so here's where we are. Actually, we're past that today. I was there this morning. This entire roof structure has been covered and you can see back here, uh, this picture was taken on Monday and it's already amazing how much work they've done, but the, they're ready to pour this foundation and the slab for the gym today, uh, this week, and then they'll start digging the pool next week. So um, progress is going along um, as well as we could hope. Um, weather's been pretty good other than that uh, one little stretch of uh, hurricane that rolled through. So we're still on schedule uh, to open the facility. Our hope is in September of next year. Um, as I said, we believe we'll serve uh, about 10,000 folks within the county uh, on a regular basis in partnership with the county and the senior center and this career and resource development center. It's been a, a labor of love. I've in my 18th year on the Eastern shore and I think I've been working on this one with volunteers like yourself for 15. Uh, the town staff have been tremendously helpful for us as we navigate a project of this size and scope. So we're grateful for Chip and his team. And, and just thank you guys for all you do. It's a, uh, not sure why you run for office and do what you do, but more power to you. <laughs> and, uh, and we're grateful that, uh, for your support um, of community projects like this. I think what you'll find is uh, the YMCA uh, will be a plus one in being able to strengthen uh, other charities and organizations that do meaningful work in this community uh, and strengthen the quality of life for so many people that live here. Uh, you'll find that um, for older adults, it's gonna be a, a hub of connection and community and then you'll see there'll be kids that'll grow up here. I, we just hired a, talking about how long I've been here, we just hired a staff person in uh, Easton uh, to be our new uh, program director and camp director, and she was a uh, kindergartner in camp when I first moved here. So when you look at kind of just that progression of it takes a, bi a village, uh, the Y will be a great resource in that. I guess the last thing I'll mention uh, from an economic development standpoint, uh, we'll have about 100 staff that'll work at this YMCA and about twice that many volunteers. So it'll be a great employment opportunity for, uh, for folks in the community that want to give back and serve, have a, a heart for making a difference. And um, yeah, it's uh, super exciting. We still got some heavy lifting to do um, to raise a little more money, but we're well on our way and I'm just excited uh, to finally see this come to fruition. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I'm sorry about your pictures. <laughs> it's okay. It was during the grading. It's to be expected. But. That site was 10 feet below grade, so there were a lot of dump trucks that had to roll in there to, to bring it up to grade. They've been there longer than 28 days, so she forgot they were there. I until know. They yeah. Were. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, you just, hopefully she just left them there and they never had to hang them up again. Yeah. On the floor. That's fine. right. <laughs> we're there like, what picture? <laughs> well said. Well said. If you're okay with it, we'll ask the um, town staff to put the slides on the website, and if you don't mind, with your email information for Absolutely. folks at home. Absolutely, happy to answer any questions, questions that anyone may yeah. have. And then uh, we should be um, kind of sealed up and um, really start able to give some fun tours here in the next uh, few months or so, which will be fun. So if at any point you'd like to come out and take a tour, I'd love to show you around. And uh, it's going to be a... Uh, once we have a date in September, we'll make sure you get it on your calendar. It's going to be a, a fun day to celebrate. We, you've talked about a lot of people being there, you know, and a lot of people working there. We've heard some questions in other forums about traffic. I was, obviously, you did a traffic study as part of the site plan. Can you speak to that just, just briefly tonight, uh, just what your plans are for traffic and 
Study yeah, you know, when we when all that data was looked at, there wasn't a concern there. We're on a actually on a way tighter site in St. Michael's, uh, where we're actually on the school site itself, and there's only one road in and one road out. I think what you'll find is is uh, with the schools being there, the Y will the Y and Senior Center will schedule and stagger its programming to where you're not creating an influx of traffic at one specific time. So we're not going to have classes and programs starting at the same time that people are trying to access. Of the school either before or after school and so it's really just a matter of working and partnering with the school system um, because that's where the main traffic flow would be to make sure, sure that that you've got good ebb and flow and it shouldn't shouldn't be any impact whatsoever gotcha thank you thank yes you. sir any other questions or comments we're glad you're here yeah, yeah, right thank you so much call attention to how wonderful tony's been ashley and i have asked yeah. if tony can be at first friday events and other events and i know you guys are helping out this weekend um just so that folks have that you're accessible and can ask questions and he's the best i've known time. him since we were kids yeah <laughs> and did did he mention that we still have like five million dollars left to raise <laughs> okay no. right. let's <laughs> make sure it was clear raise or extra Raise. <laughs> <laughs> you're hoping to hear somebody <laughs> say extra <laughs> <laughs> you see the raise more than that is going right. yeah. Yeah, we will absolutely <laughs> if anybody can raise it a rotary guy can raise there we go it. that's right you're here right Thank, thank you guys. Thank you, much. sir. Thank you. you guys, thanks so much. Have a great evening. Good to see you again. Thanks. You too. We'll move into new business. Robbie asked why any of us would do this. The reason why I did it was to talk about a Patriot pivot track closer. <laughs> uh, oh, so yes. come on up here, Kemp. And we can... How funny, because for me, it's a 12 foot disc arrow. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Uh, you have you before you um, purchase consideration for this pivot track closer. This is a piece of equipment used to uh, at the Border Reeves farm to close the tracks up caused by the pivots. Um, you know, many farmers have this piece of equipment that have the irrigation also. We would wind up using it a little more often than the farmers do because we're spraying you know, year round weather permitting and everything. And this piece of equipment will greatly uh, assist the staff and get it done in a timely manner. Uh, the FI 23 budget, it was budgeted for uh, $7,000. Uh, the prices came in under that uh, when we were striking, the, when we were working on the budget. Of course, due to the impact of COVID, uh, supply chain issues, manufacturing costs, freight costs, and all that, the prices have gone up considerably. Um, if the price on this piece of equipment is 12000 uh, I think it's supposed to, yeah, $12,040.14, and the staff recommends purchase from uh, vending machine shop. For new members of the council, we, the council, made a rules change that these sorts of purchases don't have to come to us because what were happening, uh, what was happening, where we were missing opportunities to buy things because they had to come back to us and the price was going up. So the reason why this is before us is because it's over the budget amount. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would just say to the public out there might not know what this is. Kip did a, a, a good job explaining it. We own a farm. We spray our wastewater effluent on that farm and the pivot, the, the, the center pivot irrigation wheels, because the soil is so wet, creates a track in the soil, right? This will close that track. That's what we're talking about here. It's a central tool. Otherwise, those things start to really uh, get pretty deep into the soil there. So yes, just wanted to clarify that's what we're talking about here. Uh, is there a motion to approve the purchase? Move approval. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to the purchase consideration of the 12 foot disc hero. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this piece of equipment was also uh, budgeted in the FY23 budget uh, at uh, a price of $14,000, of course. For the same reason, because of supply chain issues and so forth, the price has gone up and also there are fewer manufacturers producing 
smaller equipment. 12 foot disc is a smaller piece of equipment in today's standards for farming. Um, this piece of equipment is used, we have 23 acres of uh, conservation reserve enhancement program uh, with the USDA. These areas can only be mowed after August 15th and stop mowing by April 15th, which means the growing season through the year, nothing can be done in these areas. Uh, these areas are borders around the spray fields and everything, so it's kind of twofold. Um, with that being said, uh, saplings grow up in, in places, and when they do, they tend to be rather thick. The only way to control them, uh, aside from spraying, which is a no-no in the CREP program, uh, we go in there and moldboard plow it and then work it up with the disc and seed it down with the grass uh, so it can reestablish again. Um, that's the only effective way that we found so far to, to handle this. And uh, the, the town hasn't had a disc. We've borrowed a disc and used it and it's time that we get beyond borrowing somebody's piece of equipment. So. Uh, not that I mind loaning my equipment, but... <laughs> oh, Sarah Brunner from you. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> 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 so, oh, not yeah. that I mind, but... But you do. Uh, I mean, you know. Take your equipment to work day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it happens sometimes. <laughs> so, Kip, is this your $15,000 piece of equipment at the town? <laughs> no. Uh, Inflation hit Kip's off hard. We were only able to get uh, prices from two vendors for this. The others that we contacted uh, were in the same boat. They're no longer making the smaller piece of equipment because of supply and demand. They're making the larger stuff. Uh, only two companies. Uh, you can see the price differential there from 21500 to 15680 uh, Staff recommends the 12-foot disc purchased from Binkley and Hearst at $15,680. I make a motion to approve the purchase of the 12-foot Monroe Tough Line Disc Hero from Binkley and Hearst at the price not to exceed $15,680. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Generator service contract consideration. Is that you? Yep. No. Yep. It's uh, me also. The um, in the past uh, the past two years, you know, uh, two and a half years actually, we've added two <coughs> more generators to our gener uh, generator uh, inventory. Um, you know, we have a total of eight of them now. Uh, most of them are for the water and wastewater. Uh, we do have, uh, like the shop is on the generator now, the police department is. So uh, the thing is, uh, we don't have the staff to properly maintain these generators as, as we have in the past. And of course, with the staffing issues, uh, we don't have as many qualified people meaning we don't have the time. If these don't start up and run when they need to in an emergency, there's no sense in spending the money buying the, the generators. Uh, of those eight generators, it's approximately $295,000 worth of equipment there just in the generators. Uh, to maintain uh, these generators properly, uh, we chose Fidelity uh, power systems uh, to, to quote us for this. Uh, one thing with Fidelity, they're one of the very few companies that work on several different brands of generators. Uh, a lot of the generator companies like Cummins Onan work on mainly theirs and as far as getting parts and stuff. Uh, with this company, they can do it all on all the generators, get the parts and everything. They're rather, rather large firm in the, uh, Maryland. They have a main office on the Western Shore and another office in uh, Salt, or, uh, Seaford, Delaware. 
they have technicians that are local to this area for the eastern shore. One of them lives in uh, Smyrna, Delaware. So if we call them, we have a problem, they're very quick to get there and take, get here and take care of it. It's not like they have to come from Northern Baltimore County or Frederick, where some of these other companies are uh, located. So, uh, with that said, the, the prices are there in front of you. It's a five-year contract. Uh, it's broken down per year, and uh, you'll notice that the fifth year out is a little more expensive. Uh, the reason is the, the level of service that comes at five years. They're swapping batteries out on the fourth year. The fifth year, they're doing everything, belts, hoses, cooling, that kind of stuff. Well, you're contractually so, obligated to do those things. Yes, we, we, we have to do this to, to maintain them, and they're contracted to do it. Uh, there's two- Their contract obligates them to do that. To, yes, I'm of sorry. Service I mean, in the fifth year, okay. Yep. Um, there's, uh, they come out two times a year and check the generators over. That's included in this price. Uh, the, there's many, many things. They, they'll spend two hours doing a load test on each generator to make sure that it's working properly and everything. So, uh, I have to, you and your team don't have to worry about the generators. Is that no, all we have to do is go to them, make sure they're full of fuel. We do spot checks anyway, to, uh, cause most of them are at pump stations anyhow. So we do spot checks, to make sure the coolant and the oil levels are where they are supposed to be. But they also do it on their twice a year visit as well. They, are they mostly diesel generators? The propane, natural gas? They're all diesel. If all of them we have are diesel. They're uh, quite a bit. I, well, I could. They're a bit more reliable and less temperamental than the propane generators are. Propane generators are great. Uh, but since we, uh, we've had diesel, we just stay in line with that. So when we call to have them topped off with fuel, they go around and top them all off. So. so did I hear you correct, Kip, that so twice a year we are in a position to know that under a full load, our generators work so that you have the confidence that if they truly failed, is that correct? If they truly fail, it was not uh, due to negligence or anything to that effect. It's a true failure of the machine. It's not negligence of maintenance or anything. So, yep. Um, this line's covered under the contract services and it's gonna be absorbed across four different contract service lines in the budget. So uh, we have the room to absorb it in there and take care of it. Uh, the first year is $14,135. Um, and you can see the progression of it, so. But this is in the budget, why, just refresh. Okay, so we don't, do we need to pass uh, it, Yes, it didn't show up as a line item in the budget. You're covering it under a line item. And it's more informational for you. Okay. Uh, so do we need to make this motion or no? I think we're good. Okay. So. Thank you for the heads up on that. Yep. I think we'll move into IT, information technology by the town manager. So this is uh, for awareness, I'm not formally asking for this yet, I want to give you guys some time to think on it. Uh, as you know, I've talked uh, a lot about upgrading our infrastructure from an IT perspective. We are almost entirely dependent on Queen Anne's County now uh, in the form of setting up email accounts, in configuring uh, our computers, in our software, in pushing data to us, manual updates, manual downloads. Um, it's labor intensive and it's antiquated. Uh, you may recall several months ago, we put scanners in town hall so that we could run check boxes rather than have our admin standing at the, at the printer copying six checks at a time and doing everything manual. If you click on your pay now button when you go to pay your utility bill, you click it and then a check gets mailed from the bank to the town. Why something becomes more automated. So we're looking to move from a server-based technology to a cloud-based technology. We're looking to move out from under the thumb of 
Queen Anne County's IT to our own. And this will include unibilling, so automation, uh, AccuFund Cloud, have an HR portal, no, no more printing off our time, our, excuse me, our pay stubs and hand delivering them to our employees. No more printing off our W-2s and hand delivering them to employees. Um, these things will now be available to the employee. If they want to go change their withholdings for their taxes, they can go into the system and do that through the portal. If you, if you see the numbers here, we cut in half, more than half, the staff time that we would spend working on, the, on our IT and the, the interface perspective. Um, and then with this, when particularly with the Microsoft 365, that comes with the maintenance. Now, this is moving out from under Queen Anne's County, having our own infrastructure, and the maintenance piece, or the, the total cost, would be half of what it would be to hire our own IT person. So there's a significant savings in that perspective. There's more than what we're paying now, but not as much as it could be. Um, as you can see, it dramatically cuts down on staff time. And my idea behind automation is not that we do less, it's that we do more because now we have the opportunity to do other things that we need to get to. But we're spending time on 30-year-old infrastructure. So um, we printed this out for you guys to look at, give it some thought, and that's my two cents. Um, we would still rely on the county to provide the network um, yep. service. For now. For now. For okay. now. We're, we're talking with Carson, right. um, and, oh, and okay. we're looking at, at options to upgrade across the board at minimal minimal cost. Mm. Um, the, the answer to the unasked question is always no. Well, we're asking the question to try to figure out how do we, how do we make the infrastructure work for the town. Um, we had old routers, we had old, we have really cleaned up a lot of things to kind of make it more efficient, more effective. I, for one, am a big fan of cloud-based, and just everything I've heard up to this point is music to my ears. I'll just say that. Anything else? Not on that topic. Administrative support request. So I was prepared to bring this forward a short time ago. Um, earlier, you all voted on a change because we had 12 changes in just one section of the charter. Um, recent events that staff has been working on, we have seen a number of uh, incongruent language, uh, lack of clarity, and different things within the chartering code, incongruent between charter code and state law, incongruent between charter code and policy, incongruent between state law and policy. We have to mature the chartering code. There's some, some vague language in there. If you want to find somebody for not mowing the lawn, it's up to $1,000. We want to kind of codify that and break it down so that we have enforceable code with rigor. If we were, if you can rent a property here, there was a recent thing came across my desk that people are looking to find areas to open up Verbo or, or Airbnb type thing and asking what kind of policies do you have in your town that allow this or don't allow that. We don't have that. We don't have a standard for a property owner that rents to a resident as to how that's got to be maintained. Um, so we want to put that kind of rigor within the code and we want to make sure that we find all the places that are not concordant with things, that's the, the two-thirds majority that was just found by Sharon, and go through this, clean it all up, and look at it with a critical eye, the person we have in mind for this position uh, graduated from Harvard. Um, and it's not going to cost us as much as it would be a lawyer. So that's kind of where we're looking at it. And I would like to have that your approval to do that, not to exceed sixty thousand dollars. This is a full time employee. Yes. And, and this is for uh, how how long of a period? My my estimation would be upwards of three years. And the reason that is too is because we're going to have a lot of stuff coming through town when we start working on this plant. A lot of oversight, a lot of things that we're going to have to adhere to, and the, all the money that's going to start flowing through if we procure that money, and, and just going to have to have an extra set of eyes to prevent illegal commerce, if you will. Comments, motion. I am in favor of code cleanup. 
strongly in favor of adding some rigor around our code enforcement, as I think everyone's aware. That said, when we were doing the budget, I and others on the council at the time made pretty clear we were going to revisit headcount at the midpoint of the budget year. We're just not there yet. And, you know, just today we approved two purchases that were in over budget. I think we're going to keep seeing that. And so, as much as I see this as a really positive thing, I just really didn't want to revisit the headcount until the mid year point, and I, I still feel that way. I think I uh, find myself in the same position. I support the intent. Um, I personally would like to see um, a more detailed job description if we could get that chip, um, especially since that person is directly supporting you. I think in the spirit of you being able to focus on those most critical things, that, that's got my attention in a good way. Um, and so having that, and, and I know we have some interest in supporting the, the chief of police and revisiting um, some of the uh, law enforcement positions that we put on hold. So um, I definitely would like, as Ashley said, to hear, hear this again, but at that point. Sure. Is there a motion? All right. We will consider it again at some other time. We'll move into a discussion led by Council Member Johnson on the Central Elementary School traffic issue. Thank you. This, this is really just a footnote. Um, it's a topic that's come up in general, but then also more in particular, noting the possibility of the Carter Farm development. Um, for folks that live on Chesterfield Avenue, folks that, that flow through there for, for lunch at, at docks, whatever it is that may bring you through there, if you're coming through, uh, at the, the time that school gets out, uh, it gets backed up pretty bad. Uh, there's been some meetings that we've had up to this point that the school system, the, the COO and, and some others have been involved with that have been very helpful, chief of police, uh, town manager, uh, public works, all being involved to look at possible um, solutions uh, that would not necessarily be the cost of the town. Um, but as we have approached a point where some of those things could, um, we're not in a position where we really wanna make any um, drastic uh, improvements, anything with a significant cost, but just wanted to keep this on the council's radar screen and ask for uh, unanimous consent to, to just kind of keep it on the radar screen. I know our police department has had folks out there to kind of keep an eye on things. Um, my understanding is the school system, and it seems consistent, Chief, I'm just kind of looking for a nod, um, that they have had a staff member of theirs with a nice orange vest out there daily. They were out again today, and that really helped. And the last thing I'll just say is one of the reasons this has been a particular concern to me is I am aware of at least two occasions where because of the length of buses, et cetera, we had an ambulance that couldn't get through at one point. Um, and then we have this habit of folks saying, well, I'm not turning, so I'm just gonna drive around these 10 buses. And now they're driving in the opposite lane of traffic. So I think with the police department being on it, the school system providing um, a, a traffic manager, if you will, at the intersection, we're good right now, but just wanna keep it on the radar screen. And that's it on that. Any questions? Graffiti on the Millstream Trail. Hopefully we won't be on this too long, but if Chief of Police could come up and um, Kip, if you would, from Public Works. Um, Marshall, if you don't mind advancing the um, slide since. Oh, he changed the. Marshall, we gotta go back to the I apologize. Line. If you don't mind that, there's that one last slide, please. So as we're, we're pulling that up, um, I, I live on the end of town where this um, graffiti um, has been noted. And um, I was asked by a couple of residents in that part of town, uh, those at the captain's houses that are right near this particular area, um, the, the boardwalk that's the captain's walk. Do I have that correct? I think that's what's on the sign. Thank you. Um, at any rate, you can kind of see in the picture, um, the captain's walk entrance is the, the far left hand picture the entrance to that. So if you've been there, it's a beautiful overlook. If you haven't had a chance to do that, it's right in front of the captain's houses. Um, but what you'll see is on the, the deck, uh, the, the kind of middle picture there toward the bottom, um, you see some graffiti there that, that's pretty big. It takes up a, a, a big portion of that deck. Um, and then you see on the far right two pictures, there's some additional graffiti on the, uh, the railing. And so the two questions I had, and I of course gave the chief a heads up on this and, and Kip, um, was just to ask the question for the sake of our community's interest, do we have a problem with graffiti? And I think we know the answer to that, so I'll give that to you in a second. And then just, I think all of us believe in the wind, uh, broken window theory, you know, so we, we want to 
get rid of these things. What I would note is I, in asking for some additional intel from folks that live right there, this was not all done apparently at the same time. So while we may not have a problem with graffiti in other locations, it being there led to some additional graffiti. So just any comments you have, Chief, um, I know we're, we got a lot on the agenda that we've gone through, so we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just real quick. Yeah, real briefly, this was the first that was brought to our attention. Um, so we will make every effort to try to rectify it as far as um, you know, keeping some extra patrols in that area as well, um, now that we know this issue is going on. Um, I believe, and I think Kip can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we might have had a similar issue in the past where DPW went in and cleaned it up for okay. us. And I think it was on that same location, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what we did at that point is uh, the police department has the ability to put out cameras in the area to, to try to like uh, monitor the situation. And I think at that point, we had come up with a few suspects that were juveniles in the area at the time, uh, which they were referred to juvenile services for that. Um, so we can, we can ultimately do that again and, and take the same initiative. And I think the community would love to hear you say that we're not seeing this anywhere else. So it's not like Centerville suddenly the recipient of tagging uh, all over the place. We're not getting reports of this, no. Right. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. And then the time is the ninth of uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, as Chief said, yes, we went through a spell of it several times. Um, just here in a year or so ago, maybe. And once. They got the camera up and did their uh, investigation. It stopped. So, and all my years in public works, this is the way it happens. It goes in phases. You'll catch these kids doing it, and next thing you know, they grow up. But the next group of kids come through and start the same thing. And, uh, as soon as we know about that, yes, our crew goes out and starts cleaning it up. Um, but. With, uh, I'm not on Facebook. Sorry, I don't intend to be on Facebook. Very, find yourself fortunate, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, Facebook is no is not a plausible means of notifying me that it's wrong. Uh, everybody <laughs> has my email address. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and I had just heard about this, so we appreciate you guys um, yeah. just speaking yeah. to that quickly. I assumed Eric had done it, so. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, how many things do you have, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, I think in the past, in one of the incidents, the actual tagger put his name out there. So, <laughs> <laughs> You can't fix stupid, right? <laughs> Both relatively easy investigation. Yeah. Maybe we have a president named Ten Toes, and they did it again. The Google, Google search. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Appreciate that. No Reports of boards and commissions, Maryland Municipal League. Uh, <clears throat> nothing to report today, but I'm glad to be assigned to MML. I've served on the board and executive committee and the legislative committee in prior times, so I'm, I'm excited to be back with MML. Wonderful. Thank you. Economic development. So the uh, next fireside chat for economic development is next week on October 26th at 6 p.m. It'll be in the uh, magistrate courtroom of the old courthouse on the first floor. All are welcome uh, just for the uh, edification of our new council members. Um, CETA, our Centerville Economic Development Authority, continues to be in an odd hack. Odd I can't talk. Ad hoc. It's getting late. Sorry, I didn't know. Ad hoc status. <laughs> and um, this group is just going to continue to have discussion. Um, at this next meeting, county planning and zoning is coming to brief the county's comprehensive plan. So if you have any interest in that, perfect timing as it ties in well with what uh, is an impending approval of our town comprehensive plan. And at the same meeting, we will be presenting a scorecard that we've put together to uh, evaluate the uh, success and or uh, lack thereof in certain elements of the 2015 town economic development plan. And what I should note is that there's actually a lot of stuff that's been done. And so hats off to our previous councils. Um, there's a lot of green, if you will, if we, we're going to have a stoplight report to present eminently. So good, good stuff coming. That's all I have. Thank you. Excellent. Park Advisory Board. Just a couple things. Um, the Parks Advisory Board was uh, really happy with how the Wharf Day event went in September. And so looking to do that again, uh, hopefully next year. Um, and then the other thing is they have set the date of Sunday, November 27th to decorate downtown, meeting at noon at Town Hall, and they're looking for volunteers for that. What was that date? Sunday, November 27th at noon 
the town hall if you want to help decorate downtown for Christmas. Thank you. Council of Governments. Um, I have no report. Okay. I, I can uh, just do not a report, but just to let you know. So November 9th, the first, second Wednesday, uh, Council of Governments will meet in Queenstown. Um, Queenstown. So the first week in November, I'll send out the right. information. Great. Thank you. Uh, Planning Commission met last night in this very room. And they continue to move forward with the community plan, the comprehensive plan for the town of Centerville, which is required by law to be redrafted or revisited every decade. And it is a 10-year plan, and they are making very good progress on it. I anticipate uh, a robust public hearing on the comprehensive plan sometime in January. So I would encourage everybody to come out to that, learn about what's in your community plan. It does impact how the Planning Commission works. You know, part of their role is to determine uh, consistency with the comprehensive plan, so it's important. Uh, they also move forward. That'll happen in January, as I said, and keep an eye out for that. There's also a website for the comprehensive plan that the town staff has set up, which uh, thank you for that. Uh, I don't have that HTTP. It's the it's our the town of Centerville's address, and it's under projects. Um, the heading across the top projects plan. and um, the comp plan is on there as well as Carter Farm and, and you can see all kinds of stuff associated with the community plan all the chapters you can submit comments as well which I would encourage everybody to do uh, and also the Planning Commission granted preliminary site approval site plan approval to Taco Bell uh, folks may not be aware of that uh, so still a few more steps to go for final site plan but a Taco Bell um, in the business park out by the Dunkin Donuts. Not final yet, so you'll have to get your chalupas on <laughs> Canal and Reeston for a few more months, years, I don't know how long. <laughs> That's all I've got for the Planning Commission. We'll go into the reports of Department Heads Town Manager. Thank you. Uh, start off that MML meets in the fall and, and uh, in the summer. They also have uh, they run the thing through the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, the offices and executive programs and the Academy of Excellence. And this year, 90 um, municipal and county officers from across the state graduated from that Academy of Excellence to include our HR manager, Crystal Ewald, and our finance officer, Karen Luckman. Congratulations to both of them for working on this for the last several years. The sheet you have before you is a rundown on all the code violations we've had in the past year. About 96 different in incidents that Bob has, has run into. Uh, gives you a nice list to, to kind of look it over. And I'm sorry it's a small print, but uh, in the future I'll just do quarterly updates to you all so you can kind of see his activity. In addition to uh, things in the community, he's now helping us with the fog, the, the food, oil, and grease uh, traps at the restaurants in town. Uh, when Kip was working on this, we went down from spending about $55,000 a year cleaning out lines to about $10,000 a year. <coughs> we're going to have quarterly, we're going to enforce the code, and we're going to have the inspections of the restaurants and help them out to understand what their obligations are to make sure they keep their things cleaned out so that stuff is not going into a plan that's already stressed them up without adding extra contaminants to it. The Efforts on our plant, it was a good week, a lot of discussions happening. Uh, nothing new on the spray field, the farmer's in the middle of harvest, so I'm uh, respecting his time to spend time uh, with his crops and, and bringing things in. Also talked, we, we met today with uh, two of our delegates at the plant to let them see what our plant was and see what we are up against as far as the decay within that plant. It was a good meeting, we'll see what that yields, we still need to meet with Senator Hershey and Delegate Grist, or Grice, um, and so we're going to work to schedule them. I know they're back in town on the 25th, so I don't know if we can get them to coordinate their schedule, give them a tour of our plan to let them understand. Our lobbyist was also in attendance. Um, did a lot of research. So Hampton Roads is doing a water injection project. They started out with a 12-inch well as a proof of concept and they're moving to do 336 inch wells because they also have 
uh, degradation in their, their level of their soil, their, their ground is actually sinking. City of Westminster here in Maryland has done water reuse. Um, they are discharging into their reservoir. So these are conceptual things that have uh, a proven capacity. For us, the biggest change is that Anne Arundel County is also looking at MAR, Managed Aquifer Recharge, um, where they're going to look to discharge effluent directly into the aquifer. Now, it sounds like, oh my God, you're going to just do that, but you're talking about going through the first level of cleaning, reverse osmosis, which is far more uh, intense, and then discharging into the aquifer where you get a dilution factor because of the, the amount of water there already, similar to our lagoon when we have an issue. And then if it's brought back out of the aquifer, it's going back into your water system, but it's being cleaned again four times. You don't, you don't clean vodka that much, so it's just uh, <laughs> it's just a great deal of rigor that goes into this. Westminster was in trouble. So one of the things that people will say is in the, the North Atlantic region is that water's not an issue. Well, ask the folks in Westminster. They had to build their plant to California standards because MDE isn't out in front of this. Virginia is moving out in front of it. MDE is not quite there yet. They have a lot of questions. I also talked to the owner of Watsack who built the Westminster plant and they are well versed in what's going on at Hampton Roads. They do a lot of these projects around the country. They are gonna donate two hours of their time to come up here to look at our plant and kind of tell us what we're up against. Um, that's gonna be in November. We're meeting again with MDE uh, the 31st of October with both their surface um, spray folks and their, their underground injection folks because they do have that team to kind of say, hey, where are we? My sense is, is that we've got to get the field. Without the field, the application process stops. We're dead in the water. We have to get that the field that goes into the water sewer comprehensive plan for the county, and that's what the state is going to look at to move this forward. Once that happens, if we cannot move the technology forward on injection wells fast enough to match our timeline build, the idea is that we're gonna still move for that technology with partners across the state to say, hey, we'd like to do this too. And before we have to do the infrastructure upgrades to the field, take the opportunity to sell the field again and recoup that money um, and put it back into the well. So a lot of moving pieces on this. It's an exciting opportunity. There's just a lot of work to do to get there. I'd like to be a part of that meeting if possible with uh, the injection well folks. Yeah. Can we go back to this code enforcement for a minute? Absolutely. So a couple questions. One, what is admin duties when that's the code description? Uh, that's when he's doing his reports, filling out his timesheets. But if that's the only, like, if that's the only thing I'm seeing, like if I see a violation and then I'm not seeing any category other than admin duties, what was the violation, I guess is my question. I'll have to find out from And then my other question is, what does it take for a, a case to be closed? Because there are things on here that the violation still exists. And I'm not just talking about the Green Street self-storage, but there are sign violations on here that the signs still are there. So we opened a case, we said, hey, that's a bad sign, and then they didn't take the sign down and we closed the case. I'll follow up. And I can, I'm not gonna like call people out in a public meeting, but I can give you specific samples. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> some don't you don't wanna be on. <laughs> Chief of Police. At this time, the police department has no new business before the council. Uh, however, the next session we will have plenty to offer. Um, given the light of what's been brought this evening, I don't want to cause any more delays. Um, unless you have any questions for me this evening, I'd like to be dismissed from the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Should have asked far sooner, Chief. I think. Well, we want, would they like a hall pass? <laughs> <laughs> this this family's been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But everybody at home and in the room needs to know that this is the first time in my not so many years, but enough years that I've ever seen somebody that had the endorsement of their entire team in writing. And I just think that's worth stating for the record. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Get out of here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, good evening. Can I be dismissed too? <laughs> wow. Not yet. <laughs> Town attorney. I have nothing. All right. <laughs> Sharon. 
finance officer. <laughs> Uh, just one quick update. I got the financial audit statements draft um, reviewing. I've made a few changes. Once I get the final, I'll um, forward to everybody so you have a copy. Thank you. Thanks. Director of Public Works. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank Hi. <laughs> Hi there. It's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Jackie Payne. She is my administrative assistant, which she's been with us for a few weeks now, but finally getting a chance to bring her and introduce you to you. Um, she has done a stand-up job for just a few weeks she's been here. She comes with experience uh, in many parts of what we deal with. So she's right on task, and I greatly appreciate her, as well as I appreciate Janelle. <laughs> also. Aww. The, the, the entire town, town staff works very well together, and uh, I can't thank all of my staff enough for all they do for us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> We're excited you're here. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's be clear. Let, let the record show. <laughs> <laughs> the next part of my report is a report that I know there's no other, no public director ever wants to come to report to you. Um, we've had uh, the ladies have put a slideshow together for us because this. We had a sanitary sewer overflow that we're repairing, and this is, uh, in my career, is uh, not so much the amount of flow or where it was, but to repair it is beyond belief. But to me, not beyond belief, but it's definitely the biggest that I've ever seen as far as a repair that's going to have to be. Um, Maybe. All right, the first slide here is showing, you see the pipe in the, uh, across the ditch in the bottom. The overflow was reported uh, to us on the, the 10th, it was Monday. Chip got a hold of me, I went out that same day. Uh, because of the remote location, the report was a, a odor of sewer gas. Because of the remote location where it was, it took a while to find where the actual uh, overflow occurred. Kip, where, where, where is this exactly? Okay. It's between Jack, the Ashley property where the, um, the storage units and the new ones are being built and where Center Park is off of Little Hut. Gotcha. Uh, there's a ravine that goes down through there. The pipe you see is the actual pipe. Uh, what happened a few weeks ago, we had some pretty heavy rains. There was about five inches of rain we received. Uh, stormwater flowing down through this ravine, as you can see, washed the dirt off the top of the pipe, washed off under the pipe, causing the pipe to sag and cracking the fitting on the top side of it. Also because of some of the, uh, the high rain, we had high flows at the time. That's what caused the pipe to leak out the top of it. Uh, what's this pipe made of? Mm, terracotta. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's easy to find. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, with that being said, this ravine, that pipe is about 15 feet down. And uh, right away, we, we made a report to MDE as we are required. Uh, we made a five day letter report to them. So, they've all been contacted. They know what's going on. Uh, the bottom of that ravine is about 15 feet deep compared to the lands on each side of it. So, uh, bypass pumps were set up. It took three bypass pumps to get around this uh, particular site. Um, one of them's actually been taken out of service today because repairs have gotten far enough, but it's, it's going to be a while. Uh, that pipe is not supposed to be exposed like that? No, it's not supposed to be exposed at all. Sure. So, um, 
These are two of the, the bypass pump sites. They're both at uh, Center Park. Um, the one on the left is set up right next to the building across the street from where the uh, leasing office is. The one on the right is showing the bypass pump in the far right, right side there. And that's right up near the leasing office. Uh, the wooden pads you see there are mobilized, were mobilized right away too to be able to access the, the site. Okay. In addition to the, the problem with the pipe, it wasn't caused by our pipe. Uh, it was just caused by erosion. This was all growth over top of it. You couldn't see it at all. This is looking back towards Center Park Apartments. That's the outfall for their uh, and discharge for the bioretention stormwater pond there. It's just from two different angles. Uh, you can see the erosion that's occurred around the pipe. You can, on the right hand side, you can see water ponding right there. That's actually about three feet deep water there because it's eroded so bad right there the our pipe is the picture on the right uh right to the where you see the water edge there our pipe is right behind that barely covered up with dirt so next slide please our sewer pipe our sewer pipe yes what we're looking so, at there was stormwater right yeah that was stormwater okay we had to take about 20 trees out the the slide on the uh left is standing at Center Park looking across at the Ashley property. Uh, you'll see the tree stumps there and everything. Uh, we were able to get our tree contractor in here the next day to take those trees down to gain access to the site. Um, the, the one on the right hand side is showing you the stumps that were remaining. Next. Again, this is another, just another view back at Center Park, but where the, the excavator, the large machine is sitting there, that's on those pads that were delivered because we had to bridge across their bioretention pond to access that side. Um, a few slides before you saw all the vegetation, it looked like it was leveled right across there. That's with the vegetation removed. There's the excavator sitting on the bridge. Uh, the pads that were formed the bridge. Uh, there's a stone box there that's setting down in the bioretention pond to move forward. This is just lime covering it as a um, uh, remediation for the um, or mitigation for the. Uh, for the spill to, it helps disinfect and it kills the odor and everything. So we had to spread a good bit to, to get that part rectified. Um, this project's gonna run till probably about the second week in November before we get it all wrapped up. So this is a, a lengthy process. Like I said, there was three bypass pumps that were set in place, one of them uh, if we've gotten far enough to take that out of service and the flow is normal right there. So, um, next one, please. There's a second bypass unit oh. that's still in place. Is that There's right? There's two of them. There was three total. So two left. Yeah. Is there any um, odor leakage from those that there's no, emission? No, Nothing. there's there's no odor anymore. Uh, the the leak we had stopped. So you have a fifth one in there. So. Um, the since these photos um, they've worked very hard and diligently it took several days to get the the trees removed get the grubbing and clearing of the area done uh, get the bypass pumps set up and everything the manhole that it feeds into had to be totally replaced uh, because the degradation to the bank that was uh, there it had just it was gone. I'll bring you more photos to as it progresses or maybe at the end of it. Um, but the, it, it's a lengthy process to, to make the repairs to this. 
that particular manhole has um, three lines feeding into it, and it's the uh, one of the northernmost manholes of, I mean, the furthest manhole out on the northern interceptor, which we knew we had problems with from our I and I study, which is still progressive. So, um, any sense how many gallons of sewage leak? Because uh, when I got there, I didn't witness any flowing, but there was debris and stuff there that you could see it had flowed. Uh, so with that being said, I, I, and I explained to MDE that we have no clue how long or how many gallons were spilled. I, I do know that one of the other MDE staff on the stormwater side was on site at the Ashley property doing an inspection and he had walked the, the ravine down in the bottom there uh, just before those heavy rains and he said there was no evidence then. So it couldn't have been a very long duration of time that it happened. Sure. So. That's a gravity. Yes, system. gravity system. Mm -hmm. Probably helps in an environment like this, I suspect. <laughs> So you have a spill right there. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Any uh, any questions? Thank you for that thorough update. Yeah. Um, uh, just wanted to make sure you were up to speed with it in case you get any calls or anything. So, and welcome to stop by the site if you want to see anything further. Thank you. And thank you for your patience and you've heard enough from me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Skip. Human resources manager. Hopefully you don't have such a crappy update. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was common. We all knew. I have uh, I do not have any updates this evening. Unless you have questions. Nope. Okay. Perfect. Congrats congrats on your uh, yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. Works. Yeah. That's awesome. Took a few years and got there. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Town clerk. Um, we're just progressing with the um, Christmas parade, yeah. but other than that, I don't have any updates at this time. Um, You're in a class of your own. I am, a, I am in a class of my own, yes. Um, my husband would probably agree with you on that one. Um, no, I am taking the, um, uh, through the uh, University of Baltimore School of um, Public Policy, the Certified Public Manager um, course, which is a, basically runs through June, um, one week a month, every other month. And uh, so this was my first week and I am drained. And um, so, yeah, as part of my, um, the program, I have to do a capstone project, which has to be um, affiliated with where you work. So I, my project after speaking with Chip and Kip um, is going to be on the benefits um, of injection wells for municipal government. So, We'll see how that goes. And um, <laughs> Janelle has lots of information for me, she told me. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's really a great course. Um, this is typically a $6,500 course for anyone who wants to take it. And this year they offered only for government um, a fee waiver. So I was able to get in on this class with no cost. Um, so yeah, and it, it's a, it's a na nationwide national um, certification and I'm just really excited to be a part of it. So, but it's draining and I, um, I know I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. I'm in, I'm in mental overload at this point. So. Well, we're excited you'll be drilling down on those irrigation yeah. wells. <laughs> That's my, I'm done. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are watching. It's not just at home, kids. <laughs> That's your dad right there. Yeah. No, everything else? Uh, no, I'm done. All right, Thank Citizens you. Forum. We'll move into Council Roundtable. Councilperson Beecham. Nothing for me. Councilperson Worth. 
Uh, just want to thank everyone who's trying to bring me up to speed, especially on the uh, Carter Farm, which I'm glad we table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councilperson Johnson. This is a question for Carolyn. Did I provide last time? I cannot remember, and I know you're fried too. Um, an update on the 4th of July money? So, I, don't, I, I did. So. so we're good yes. there. I, I think you to... did give a, yes, you did give an update. Coming to the we table. are, yes, we are having our fireworks presentation next year. We have uh, the funding, so. At Bloomfield Park. At Bloomfield Farm, yes. Nothing further. Wonderful. Vice President Kennedy. I have nothing. I will yield back as well. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Meeting adjourned. That's pretty good.